France's insistence on restoring civilian presidents following coups in African countries was motivated more by preserving its vested interests in these countries than by defending democracy. France's historical influence in its former African colonies was frequently characterized by intricate relationships with local leaders who maintained close ties and allegiances to French interests. In cases such as Niger, France's demand for the return of figures, such as Mohamed Bazoum, reflected its preference for leaders who aligned with French agendas, ensuring continued support for France's economic, political, and strategic goals in the region. A similar scenario played out in Gabon, where Ali Bongo faced a challenge to his presidency. Despite internal political turmoil, France's insistence on Ali Bongo's reinstatement echoed its strategy of preserving established ties and alliances beneficial to its interests in the region. This pattern demonstrates France's proclivity to protect long-standing relationships with African leaders who have shown loyalty or cooperation with French policies, indicating a pragmatic approach that prioritizes stability and continuity in these nations, even if it means sacrificing democratic ideals or popular sentiments within those countries. Now it has turned out that France was financing these presidents and the violence in the Sahel region. Earlier, it seemed a bit of a wild coincidence that all the former French colonies were facing terrorism. That's when France moved forward and pretended to be the savior. But in reality, it wanted its troops to be in these former colonies, so exploitation and French interests could be protected. Evidence has surfaced that these corrupt civilian presidents had wealth in France and were provided with luxury rewards. At the same time, violence in African countries was sponsored by France to ensure that French troops were never kicked out. But what is this evidence, and what more does it reveal? Let's know about that in this video. The history of the European empire throughout history. France has played a significant role in the colonization of various African nations during European imperialism. The expansive French colonial empire in Africa spanned a vast territory, bringing numerous nations under French rule. It included the West African region, where countries like Senegal, Mali, Guinea, Ivory Coast, Burkina Faso, Niger, Chad, and Benin exist today. Not only that, but the Central African region, including countries like Gabon, the Republic of the Congo, the Central African Republic, and Chad, were under the umbrella of French Equatorial Africa. Algeria, Tunisia, and Morocco were designated French colonies in North Africa. U France implemented a system of direct rule in some regions and indirect rule in others. Direct rule involved French administrators directly managing the colonies, while indirect rule involved local leaders operating under French control. Later, decolonization gained momentum after World War II as colonies began seeking independence. In 1956, Morocco and Tunisia successfully achieved independence, followed by Algeria in 1962, after a prolonged and contentious war of independence. Upon gaining independence, many African nations maintained strong connections with France, driven by economic, cultural, and political ties. However, some nations opted for a more independent path, leading to tensions in certain cases. That's when the term Francophone Africa emerged, identifying African countries where French is the official language, often indicating historical ties to French colonialism. These nations frequently engage in partnerships and agreements with France, showcasing French influence in language, education, and economic relations. The CFA franc, initially linked to the French franc and later the euro, was used in many former French colonies. This currency had two distinct versions, the West African CFA franc and the Central African CFA franc. The historical connections between France and its previous colonies underscored the lasting impact of the colonial legacy. France aimed to uphold influence by backing or manipulating specific elements within these nations. It's because France held economic interest in the region, including access to valuable resources like oil and minerals. To ensure things worked smoothly, France had certain groups and individuals that could help it safeguard its economic concerns in these countries. Not only that, but France wanted to send its troops to its former colonies that could protect its economic interests. But that was not easy, as it required a solid excuse. What could be a stronger excuse than terrorism and violence? 
Immediately, the former French colonies in Africa saw a surge in terrorism, creating a path for French military presence. Therefore, terrorist activities were financed and organizations were created that could create violence and make the countries ask for military assistance from France. That's what Mali officially revealed. During the United Nations General Assembly session, Abdallah Diop, Mali's Minister for Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation, strongly criticized certain foreign powers, accusing them of perpetuating the criminal activities of terrorist groups in the region. The reference to France in his statement was apparent, and he stressed that Mali had previously raised concerns with the Security Council about France's actions on August 15, 2022. However, these actions continued without consequences, seemingly shielded by France's status as a permanent council member. You, in essence, despite Mali following the proper channels and lodging complaints about France, the United Nations remained inactive. France faced no questions, even though it was widely known how deeply involved the country was in African affairs. Minister D. Op expressed his disappointment at the international response to Mali's security challenges, stressing that the severity of the threats did not match the decade long presence of international forces. The expectations of the Malian people, as conveyed by national authorities, often went unheard. Minister D. Op further criticized the United Nations multi dimensional integrated stabilization mission in Mali called Minus Mo, for its ineffective contribution to restoring national territorial control. He argued that Minisma's actions exacerbated the security situation, spreading from the north to the south and central regions of Mali. U.S., instead of fighting terrorism, these operations were multiplying the terrorist organization, making things quite shady. Criticizing the mission's alleged use of human rights for political gains, Mali ordered its withdrawal by December 31 this year. Minister Diop's tone conveyed Mali's shift from requesting or begging to a more assertive stance. Mali aims to inform the international community of its plans and execute them without wasting time in the United Nations, particularly in feudal complaints about France. He expressed skepticism that the West cares about the tarnishing image of the United Nations, highlighting the trust deficit that may cost the UN dearly. He concluded that the illusion of the United Nations as an international body capable of enforcing compliance with international law has faded, especially after France's actions in Africa and the UN's apparent ignorance. The clear message is that developing and weak countries should expect little from the United Nations. In 2022, when France withdrew its Barkhane forces from Mali, tensions between Bamako and Paris remained high. Mali took its concerns to the United Nations, with its foreign ministry sending a letter to the UN Security Council, accusing France of aiding jihadists within Mali and breaching its airspace. The letter, which used straightforward language like aiding jihadists, represented an unprecedented formal expression of such accusations. The letter highlighted the possession of several pieces of evidence, demonstrating France's unauthorized entries into Mali and airspace for the benefit of terrorist groups, including the dropping of weapons and ammunition, an assertion that appears striking. Mali claimed to have proof that France was directly assisting terrorists, yet the United Nations took no action, paying no heed to the matter. The letter highlighted approximately 50 incidents of repetitive and frequent violations of Mali and airspace by French forces forces since the beginning of 2022. Drones, helicopters, and fighter planes were claimed to have flown over Mali without authorization from Bamako. Regarding the accusations of espionage, Dio's letter accused the French of engaging in spying activities, including the dropping of packages by the French army on August 8. The Malian army asserted that covered overflights occurred after an attack on the Tesset camp, indicating an uncoordinated airspace breach. According to DIOP, this evidence suggested that terrorist groups, particularly the Sahelian branch of the Islamic State group, received significant external support and expertise. This support meant weapons sufficient to continue the insurgency in Mali, potentially facilitating France's continued presence in the region. It's noteworthy that this wasn't the first time Mali accused France of violating its airspace. Similar claims emerged in April, following the discovery of bodies from a mass grave in Gozi, which were returned to Malian forces.
Later, France denied airspace violations, dismissing the allegations as disinformation. In his letter, Dayop urged an emergency meeting of the UN Security Council and warned of Mali's right to self-defense if such activities persist, potentially jeopardizing the country's stability and security. Later, a report by FATF, the Financial Action Task Force, exposed everything. It unveiled the strategies employed by terrorists and their backers in West Africa for fundraising, transferring, and utilizing funds. This collaborative research initiative between the Intergovernmental Action Group Against Money Laundering in West Africa and FATF collected data from experts in five West African nations with a notable history of terrorism-related incidents, Burkina Faso, Mali, Niger, Nigeria, and Senegal. The report outlines various channels through which terrorists obtain funding, highlighting financing through non-governmental organizations, charitable institutions, and levies. It also highlights the illicit smuggling of arms, assets, and currencies using cash couriers as a significant method. Notably, the report raises concerns about potential French involvement in financing terrorists, emphasizing the need for accountability due to the roots of many NGOs in Africa being traced back to France. For terrorists, despite successfully securing funding, acquiring weapons and ammunition, poses challenges due to the absence of private weapon factories in African countries. The report points out that the weapons used by terrorists in Africa are often manufactured in the West. This aligns with claims by Mali's government, accusing France of using its airspaces illegally to deliver weapons. The enduring presence of terrorism in West Africa African countries is suggested to be tied to France's vested interests. Suspicions have led to protests against French troops' anti-jihadist operations, fueled by the belief that France benefits from the ongoing terrorism, enabling the exploitation of regional resources. Mali has taken proactive steps by addressing this matter through a letter to the United Nations and exposing the situation in the General Assembly. Here's a reminder to please like and share the video and subscribe to our channel to watch more videos on black culture, history, civilization, and identity. Let's continue now. After financing violence and sending troops to former colonies, France's next strategy was to find loyal presidents or make those people presidents that would always be the French puppets. France maintained influence in its former African colonies through various methods, including support for leaders aligned with French interests. This influence has faced criticism for potentially perpetuating a cycle of economic dependency and political instability in the nations affected. France knew that certain leaders in certain African countries may prioritize personal wealth over their nation's welfare. Accusations of corruption and collaboration with foreign entities, including multinational corporations, have been leveled against some of these leaders. Motivated by personal gain, these leaders engaged in agreements allowing foreign entities to exploit their country's resources in exchange for personal wealth and ongoing political support. Africa had living examples of presidents who had sold their loyalty to France until this year when they were dethroned. Gabon's former president, Alabango, and his family are someone you should know about to understand how subtly and secretly some African leaders sell them out. Alabango served as the president of Gabon from 2009 to 2023, while his family collectively ruled Gabon like a dynasty for over 56 years. Their rule started in 1967, with Alabango's father governing for 41 years before Bongo's 14-year term concluded when military officers seized power this year. The military intervention stemmed from concerns about the credibility of the August 26 presidential election, where Bongo secured a third term, triggering a severe institutional crisis. However, the new leader of the military government, General Brace Clothair Olegin Guima, is Bongo's cousin and holds the position of commander in chief of the Gabonese Republican Guard, the country's most influential security force. Political analyst Francois Conradi of Oxford Economics proposes that the ongoing events may signify internal tensions within Gavin's elates and the extended Bongo family. According to Conradi, there are indications that the coup was orchestrated by the broader elite in Gabon to protect itself by ousting the narrow elite, consisting of Alabango, his family, and his family. Son Niretin and his wife Sylvia. 
The presidential election faced challenges, including an internet shutdown during voting, and the opposition criticized the arrests of local election monitors as fraudulent. Last many legislative rules seemed to favor Bongo's party, and upon announcing the results, the electoral body declared that Bongo had secured 64%. In comparison, his main rival, Albert Indusa, won 30%. Conradi suggests that the Gabonese people plan to protest for a recount, attracting significant international attention. Being part of Bongo's inner circle, General Nainyema might have initiated the power grab to preempt potential public protests in support of OSA. The Bongo family has wielded influence for over five decades, consolidating power through patronage and assigning lucrative government roles to allies and extended family members. The family's rise to power began when Bongo's father, Albert Bernard, received support from France to become president in December 1967. Omar won several elections amid allegations of electoral rigging, establishing a one-party system and concentrating power. All this was possible due to French backing. The Bongo family's control extended to military, parliamentary, and state commerce positions, ensuring loyalty through the redistribution of the nation's oil wealth. You should know that Murray, Madeline and Baranzo, the current president of the Constitutional Court, was Omeniar's former lover. Since Omeniar's, France became a close ally through the Francofreak system, where French corporations cultivated favorable relationships with African politicians to secure lucrative resource deals. Later in 2007, a French police investigation revealed that the Bongo family owned 39 properties in France, 70 bank accounts, and 9 luxury cars, amounting to 1 5 million euros. This made it clear that the Bongo family was being paid well for their treason to their own country. Omar only made 20 euros per month as a president, but the assets were far more than he could earn in his lifetime. According to the United States Senate, Omanour allegedly funneled $100 million in suspect funds through a Citibank account in New York between 2003 and 2007. Over time, the Bongos heavily invested in French politics. Reportedly, Parisian lawyer Robert Bordy received $20 million in cash from five African heads of state, including Omanour, to support Jacques Chirac's election campaign. However, Paris prosecutors abandoned the investigation due to insufficient evidence. You can guess why this happened. After succeeding OMAR in 2009, Alabongo aimed to distance himself from France. Despite Gabon joining the British Commonwealth and implementing environmental conservation policies, oil wealth continued to flow. Within Bongo's inner circle, French authorities indicted nine of Omar's children for fraudulent real estate dealings, totaling at least 85 million euros. It sent a clear message that if France could reward the Bongo family for its help, it could also punish it if the family did not help France. Later, Bongo faced disputes in his three election victories, with protests intensifying after his 2016 re-election. His primary rival, John Ping, a former brother, in-law and half-Chinese diplomat had connections to the elder Bongo's cabinet. Concerns about Bongo's fitness to lead arose after a stroke in 2018, leading to political changes following a failed coup attempt in 2019. Bongo reorganized his cabinet, targeting corruption. High-ranking French Gabonese Bryce Lacrouchette Alajanga was arrested, and Bongo's eldest son, Nureddin, assumed a significant role. The Bongo family's resilience against coups involved appeasing opponents and making strategic appointments, inadvertently facilitating Guma's ascent. However, the reputation that France was the one forming the Bongo family and bringing it to power remained. Pro-democracy groups accused Bongo of transforming the presidency into a hereditary institution. A 2020 investigation into the Bongo family's U.S. assets revealed that Nguima's real estate investments were in cash, showing they were done with black money. French media has spotlighted the lavish assets of Gabon's ousted president in France, revealing the wealth accumulated by the Bongo family during their 56-year rule. A 2008 investigation by French judges disclosed that Omar Bongo and his children, including Ali Bongo, acquired numerous assets in Paris's most prestigious neighborhoods. 
The Daily Liberation reported that they were purportedly funded with corrupt money from companies like Elf Total, according to judicial investigations. The family's extravagant holdings include a 5 400 square meter private hotel in the Ministry and Embassy District, additional apartments in upscale Parisian areas, and villas in Nice, a well known Mediterranean city. Although the value of these assets was considered immeasurable, a 2022 court order estimated it to be around $85 million. It clarified that the late President Omar Bongo amassed millions of euros and numerous real estate assets in Paris and Nice. Hence, the apparent distance ties with France were closer. Nice, a Mediterranean tourist destination in France, features affluent neighborhoods like Semes, where Omar Bongo acquired multiple estates over the years. One of the properties, St. Ange Villa on Flyray Avenue, was purchased by Omar Bongo for $1.9 in 1999. An investigation into Bongo's properties commenced in 2010, leading to charges against nine children of Omar Bongo related to misuse of public funds, corruption, money laundering, and abuse of social goods. Despite Ali Bongo's protection under presidential immunity, the recent military takeover in Gabon could alter the legal landscape. A Paris court order in February 2022 emphasized that Omar Bongo's large fortune originated from misappropriating public funds and corrupt dealings with oil companies. But Ali Bongo is not alone. He is joined by Mohamed Bazoum, who has been closer to France than anyone else. That's why France has given up on all its operations just to focus on demanding his return to the presidency. One thing becomes clear here. As France cares about its interests and is ready to finance terrorism in Africa, a friend to France can never be loyal to Africa. Be loyal to, now, the demand by France makes it clear that Mohamed Bazam served only France and the multinational companies working in Niger. France could get uranium at the lowest possible prices, while multinational companies could get raw materials and markets in Niger without paying any taxes. In return, Mohamed Bazam got full support from France, as well as wealth and assets that remain secret. You can imagine the bond between France and Mohamed Bazam by the fact that France did not care about why there was a coup in Niger in the first place. It just said one thing that the US later demanded, reinstate Mohamed Bazam. France and the Western countries have habitually given orders to corrupt civilian leaders like Ali Bongo and Mohamed Bongo. They don't know that they don't matter much for the military juntas in these countries. Military juntas have full public support, which makes them stronger than ever to bring radical change and ensure that disloyal and corrupt leaders can never come to power, no matter how much France finances them in elections. The situation in Niger is pretty complicated, and the apparent support for the coup can be understood by looking at the history and geopolitical factors at play. The sentiment is that people in Niger are backing the coup to distance themselves from France and prevent more resource exploitation. People supported the coup because they believed a change in leadership might lead to a stronger stance against external influence, especially from former colonial powers. This sentiment is not exclusive to Niger and can be seen in other countries striving for more autonomy and control over their futures. Isn't it pretty clear that France was behind the violence and terrorism in African countries like Niger? Is it possible that the increase in terrorism in Niger, Burkina Faso, and other countries is due to France, which is trying to create a need to send back its troops? Let us know your thoughts on how African countries should handle France, which always uses dirty tactics to create conflicts in Africa. You thanks for watching.